Hello. And I think we're still waiting for Daniel um, to show. Oh, no, no, Daniel's there. Okay, great. And David, there we go. There we go. Hi, everyone. Great. great to see everybody here. Thanks very much, Brian, for that uh, introduction. So today's format will be, I think, um, maximally informal. There's no need for, um, for us to observe a dusty procedure here. So if we could just start with a, a general introductory question, which is um, given the, the enormous um, journalistic and public and financial interest in NFTs over the last half a year or so, how exactly have they impacted your work? Shall I begin? <laughs> oh, absolutely, sure. please. Yeah, let's okay. um, let, let inspiration dictate the, the passage of events. Well, I, I have done this really as an experiment to see what's out there, what does it mean for me as an artist, what could it mean for us in the future as musicians. So I really just, I released a few, um, a kind of bundle of them, uh, they went up about three or four weeks ago, and a few of them are sold and a couple of them haven't. Um, it was really insightful just to understand the space and how actually really complex it is and how it's changing every single day. Um, and how even I, Imogen Heap, um, early you know uh, interests in blockchain still found it really hard to you know to to sell my nfts um you know you really have to be in amongst it um and uh, and really kind of live and breathe it um, but for me what it's changed is my imagination of how i could create music in the future not just like song format but in kind of short form something kind of more bite-sized manageable chunks for me especially as a mother and kind of doing a lot of things I'm quite excited about the idea that there is no kind of template right now it can it can literally be an idea for a song or a few lyrics here or something over here it's very undefined and I really like that play space it doesn't kind of block us in um, so that's what's exciting about it for me right now how about you Dan In the last six months, uh, in the last six months, I guess I, I left my job and started a new business all around NFTs. So uh, it's, it's impacted me significantly, I think it's fair to say. I think it's incredible the, the way there's this groundswell of enthusiasm and blockchain has sort of managed to cross into the public attention in a way it's never actually succeeded in doing so before through NFTs. Blockchain primarily has been used for you know, decentralized finance, uh, experimentation, and you know, that's a huge market and very exciting, but NFTs represent all things, all assets, all media, all creativity, and that's so much bigger of a market and to see the potential of experimentation and creativity that Imogen was talking about unleash uh, in those various fields. It's been, it's been wild and fun. Uh, maybe this would be the point just to get a little bit of context on Palm. Would you like to explain the background to the project? Yeah, sure. So I, my, by way of my personal background, I spent the last three and a half-ish years uh, leading the protocol engineering group at Consensus. And so uh, we're very close to the Hyperledger Foundation, for example. We contributed uh, Hyperledger Besu uh, and sort of have a couple of members in my team or former team on the technical steering committee. And, uh, what I realized as the NFT uh, craze was exploding is that a lot of the technology we had already built uh, with Hyperledger Basu for enterprises like JP Morgan Chase or UBS or MasterCard could solve a lot of the challenges that NFTs have on mainnet Ethereum. And so uh, in partnership with some amazing creative partners and consensus as a technical partner, we decided to launch Palm as an NFT optimized chain inside the Ethereum ecosystem uh, that's sort of scalable, low gas, high throughput, uh, and really optimized for creators and rewarding creators. And then Palm NFT Studio on top of that is uh, basically today suggests a creative studio to help and partner with creators, brands, content owners, and so forth to land in Palm. Actually, on that note of um, collaboration, Imogen, is this some um, given your own personal interest? Have you noticed much uh, collaboration or cooperation between musicians, or do you find yourself as uh, sort of a solo point of, of energy and enthusiasm? Huh. Um, no, I found a lot of collaborations uh, in the music space um, around this. I mean, even just on the on my own personal little NFT that I released, um, it was musicians who were supporting me to do that. Um, there doesn't seem to be competition in the same way I think there's this feeling that 
you know, there's just so much opportunity and it's fun. Um, this kind of idea of pipping each other up against each other just doesn't seem to exist in this space. Um, so actually Don Diablo, he's a very successful uh, musician, DJ, and he has, uh, he, I mean, he's done amazingly well with his NFTs and he's spent a whole year creating these amazing pieces, so fair enough. Um, but he bought my first one and uh, there may be a collaboration in that in itself, you know, that he takes a little piece of this idea because it's a sort of kind of seven second looped piece of music of an idea, of, of a cappella piece. Um, so he's inspired to take that on. So it's kind of interesting to discuss what is the IP in, in this NFT or was it there at all? Um, so it's quite... It's really exciting to be able to have those discussions um, openly right now because none of these things are are defined. Um, so it's good to work with people, and we have to do it because otherwise, you know, there's going to be this. People are going to come in like publishers and labels, and they're all going to try and get a piece of it and not really understand. We're not going to have a chance to to let it have its full potential. So I think it's really important that musicians get in. Even now, it's a bit confusing just to explore and kind of have a bit of fun with it. And when it comes to audios in, or audio in particular, what do you uh, what have you found or what do you think might be the most um, successful marriage of different art forms? Would it be audio with a video loop or audio with a static image? What strikes you as maybe the most promising combination of audio with another form of expression? I mean, one of the some of the most beautiful ones I've seen are, are Holly Herndon's. Uh, Holly Herndon and Matt Dryhurst have released some um, absolutely beautiful um, in on Foundation, I think. Um, and uh, I mean, that just seems like the perfect kind of to me anyway. I, if I I would like to buy them, if they've gone up way too much for me. But um, just the way that all the technology is integrated and the AI and all the projects that they have, it just feels like a beautiful. Um, kind of it feels like the perfect place it wouldn't exist if it wasn't for nfts and it feels like this new art forms are being born like every day um so i don't know i feel like not putting it into a box um because it seems like that box is just kind of being already out of shape by just saying one thing um but i really love you know some of the just simple photography it's just really beautiful kind of parallax photography of nature or it's what i love about it is it's about these 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 NFTs, they feel more like about a moment in time. They're like encapsulating a moment, which is something that you can contemplate rather than music, which on streaming services, it just feels like this kind of endless kind of stream of noise. And, you know, it's kind of in the background. It's not really being paid attention. And this is kind of, the, it feels like the flip of that right now. It feels like people are really paying attention to these quite detailed small pieces. And I think that's really lovely. And Dan, what, is, what how have you found it? Um, because obviously you're showcasing the work of multiple artists. Has there been a particular way in which um, audio or music has been um, uh, published? So we haven't, like Palm launched yet. We actually have some major milestones today and in the coming weeks, which I'll, I'll let people who announce these things announce them. But uh, in terms of what I've seen out there, I think, but my favorite audio project is Winter Beats so far. Uh, I think both the way they experimented on generative music, but also experimenting with bonding curves and other crypto native primitives is really cool, um, really challenging, really innovative. Uh, and I think it sort of speaks to the creativity in the space. Um, but I love, I think there's such a powerful kernel of truth in what Imogen just said about people paying attention to the medium. And I think it's because we have a different relationship to content when we feel like we own it or have a say in the content. The whole rise of streaming has become this one-way flow of content that's really, I think, made the fan sort of peripheral in that process, not a stakeholder, not care as much, and therefore not as much of a fan. And NFTs, I think, reshape the relationship between creator and fan and bring them back in to the process by having an ownership stake. And that's really powerful. And I think we're just at the beginning of what, what that can actually mean. So ultimately, when those, when one or multiple art forms are put together, one of the appeals of NFTs is that they perhaps become uh, collectibles. And that brings us directly to you, Brendan, because you're in the field of sports collectibles. And because I'm rather familiar with some of your work, I know very well that you take, let's say, the traditional static design of what previously on paper or cardboard would have been a 
uh, a card, a baseball card or a basketball card, but you you join it with a little, for example, a little video loop. So given that you're already doing some of the things that we just talked about in the field of music, but in sports, how have NFTs changed your very well-established world of um, tangible static collectibles? Well, it's been very exciting. Um, first of all, every, everyone's talking about them. They They kind of dawned on the public consciousness in a really big way in the first quarter of this year. Uh, Panini launched its uh, NFT product in January of last year. And uh, it was difficult because we were having to think how to explain an NFT. And then all of a sudden we no longer have to explain an NFT, at least um, with respect to collectibles, but certainly lots of questions around what it means to be authentic and what are the um, actual contractual rights and is it property and is it not? And is a token good enough and what all these things mean? But, um, you know, the, the athletes, the agents, um, the entertainers that we work with, they've all been hugely interested and motivated in this direction. They see it as a, as a, as a new opportunity. Uh, there's lots of different uh, uh, emerging uh, points of distribution. And of course, um, lots of conversations around royalties and, and what it means for the creators and the, the, you know, the, the people in the creator uh, communities. As, a, uh, as the largest, one of the largest licensees in the world, um, you know, we're, we're really focused on protecting the, uh, first, the Panini brand as a 60 year brand. Uh, and of course we represent some of the largest um, licensors in the world and, um, and we're practicing in a 120 year old uh, collectible category. So we've moved uh, deliberately and slowly. We're actually using um, the Hyperledger Sawtooth uh, technology. And uh, we're really excited about the future of, of the category and what it means for collecting. Since um, two of you have already mentioned Hyperledger, um, needless to say the issue of well, the positive issue of blockchain te technology lies behind a lot of what we're, we're discussing. So, um, Brendan, how has the issue of forgeries um, uh, been addressed or maybe even just appreciated by your, by your client base? Because when we're talking about, let's say, for example, baseball cards, I mean, for decades, there's been a, an enormous problem with, um, with forgeries. Sure. So, you know, the, this technology has evolved very quickly. And in fact, it's it's evolved quicker than the actual adoption of uh, different um, decentralized identity solutions, for example, and uh, establishing authenticity. So if you have a, a major uh, company that's representing what they're doing, either on a public or a private uh, blockchain network, um, that can be uh, a really strong point of authentication. But in, in the larger world, the larger community of uh, creators, um, if anyone on the internet can be a dog, well, anyone uh, that's creating uh, NFTs can uh, potentially rip off your work. And so there's uh, some really important work um, that's ongoing in terms of how to create uh, public registries and certification process for the creators and the, the content developers um, so that uh, you have the strongest authentic authentication possible at the point of creation, when it's actually, when, when the creator um, assigns it to a public blockchain, it's connected to the, um, uh, the network, you know that that, that is a, a strong and, and perfect bond. And you've got the surety that you need that it's actually either officially licensed or created by the person who's representing it. And when it comes to creators, actually that brings us directly back to you, Imogen. Um, one of the things we haven't, well, we've only been here for 10 minutes, but one of the things we haven't yet touched upon is um, uptake. Uh, what barriers do you think there have been or what have the greatest obstacles been to public involvement or, or uptake? How hard are these things to make uh, for you and your, um, your peers? Yeah, um, well, everyone has a different story because there's so many different routes. Um, there's, you know, different markets. There's, in, you can go your own way and kind of bespoke create your plan. Um, I mean, I really didn't know what I was doing. So I, I worked with somebody um, called Sam Porter, who, sorry, Sam Parker, 
um, who does know the space a bit. And he, uh, after a lot of kind of deliberation and chatting to this other guy, Tim Exile, who we launched it with this company called Endless, um, where I made the little pieces on, um, we decided to go with Cargo to, you know, put all the information and again, they would go to, um, what's the name of that thing? Permaweb, Arweave. Um, so that they'd be stored on Arweave and then we would put them up on OpenSea. And um, so we had these three different kind of pieces to it. And then it was the, the metadata, you know, we almost, and in fact, we actually, they put it up. Um, and then I was like, wait, we haven't done the metadata yet. Um, they were like, oh yeah. So we had to take them all down again and then go in and make sure that the metadata was perfect because that's a real opportunity um, that we don't have in digital distribution a lot of the time is to be able to explain where it comes from, who did what, how much percentage might be going to a charity, for example, um, to be able to exhibit that and be connected to that piece is, you know, what I've been dreaming about for music to be for so long, to be able to see the history and the, all the people involved that it remains intact. So that's exciting. Um, but yeah, other musicians do it in their own way. Um, and that's the thing. There is no kind of set place. There's, there's like, Hikeknunk and there's this thing over here and if you're lucky you get onto foundation and you know there's there's so many great places um and I'm sure there's a million there's probably like 20 more since I you know did my research just three weeks ago um so it is a, a kind of free-for-all right now um there is a misconception that because we only hear about the big sales uh that is, if you put a, if you put you know an nft up you're going to make tons of money which is kind of what i thought um but um that's not the case you know you still need to work it just like anything else out there and go out and market it and you know um so the people who are successful are there who are kind of living and breathing it and they're working the clubhouse rooms um and they're in the community you know and rightly so you can't just swoop in and like suddenly make a bunch of money just like you can't do in the music industry you know you've got to work at it for years and you've got to get to know your people and you've got to do your touring it's not an easy win um but it is a very exciting space and i and i do love to um share the positivity because the future is really exciting um and it will become much easier and there will be services that will take bigger cuts and it will just make it easy for artists to go up and, you know, put up stuff and they'll curate it. And, you know, so I just hope that there's going to be lots of options. Um, the thing um, that really does need to happen, as Brendan mentioned, is the identity layer. How do we connect the NFT to the artist or the creator? Um, and how do we enable them to be really searchable across different um, blockchains, across different services? Um, like a massive marketplace of, you know, every bit of art that could be out there. How do we find them? Um, and for things to be, you know, interoperable and transferable. And um, so, yeah, so much still to do. But, um, and, and for many artists, I would actually say, if you don't have lots and lots of time, um, maybe don't go into it right now. But if you're a bit nerdy and you're curious um, and you like getting stuck in, then go for it because we need you. <laughs> On the subject of um, identity and metadata, that's probably a good time to ask you about the Creative Passport. Yeah, so the Creative Passport um, really came out of uh, hearing about blockchain for the first time, uh, or exactly six years ago, actually, uh, in May not, yeah, this year. Um, my friend Zoe Keating told me about blockchain um, because I was lamenting about having to like have this song and then upload it and then none of the data kind of sticks to the song I'd have to go in and make sure everyone's registered you can't be sure whether everyone gets paid um, and just on discovering really what blockchain and smart contracts and this kind of that world could look like if it was put in the right directions and the pieces were kind of puzzled together correctly um, we could have a really fluid fast sustainable transparent um, you know, thriving music, music ecosystem with tons of services, you know, with uh, songs, with all of their data intact on a, you know, an amazing ledger that can get searched and anything you want to need to know about those songs, including who to pay, um, would be agreed by all parties and be able to be seen. Um, and then the identity layer, which I realized was missing 
um, from a lot of the services were kind of building things actually for the major labels because that's where all the rights are, um, but not really thinking about how the musicians independently were going to benefit from these features. Mm -hmm. And I kept hearing about all this service. I'm like, yeah, but how do we, how do I get a part of that? And they're like, well, yes, yeah, kind of through the labels, we're doing these deals with the labels. And I'm like, no, it's happening again. We're just recreating old problems in a new, amazing possibility, possible space. So we started to develop the Creative Passport, which is really a digital identity for music makers. At the moment it's in beta and it's actually quite static. It just um, is a knowledge store for, you know, your biography, your, um, your press picture, your skill sets, your websites, uh, maybe your NFTs, um, whatever you want to share publicly in one place that you might want to share um, a kind of like a dashboard, like a, a patch bay of information that's public and privately permissible that you can decide I want this information to be shared with these people and this information not to be shared. Um, so you could have like, I want my biography to be freely shared across all music services that come share our APIs. And then you would have biography and press image always up to date, always exactly as you want it. Um, but equally, if somebody wanted to cross-reference some information about you, they could find it with your skill sets, combined with your passions, combined with your interests, you know. So it's really just um, a base layer. And at the moment, we're just trying to uh, rally together musicians to understand the importance of data um, and the value in their data just on its own you know, ahead of the music, but just get that bit right, get yourself organized. And we can be prepared to allow those services in the future to, to know that we are who we say we are. We, I am Verified Imogen Heap, um, and, and I can start to plumb into these services without them having to do the KYC. Um, so at the moment, it's very early stages, um, but really it's about kind of sharing a vision and trying to get musicians to sign up to actually what well, there's not really very much there, um, but it's just together we're going to continue to develop um, this platform because um, ultimately it could be that our CEO in a couple of years time um, would be the DAO, you know, it'd be a DAO of musicians. Um, yes. And we're just already starting to explore, you know, voting and, and governance just in a kind of soft way um, where we're just about to launch a website where you can just vote basically and suggest changes. I got inspired by seeing the Flamingo app, uh, Flamingo DAO app. Um, page so so it's just very early stages like we don't have a way to do the KYC in terms of the person um, so we do need to work with top layer kind of DID um, companies um, so we've actually been I mean I've done so many of those here's your passport yes I do want this uh, crypto wallet to you know basically all that stuff I've done that so many times um, mm -hmm. But we know that it's going to become the norm you know we're all going to have a digital identity and then this stuff's going to be way easier but right now you know um as brendan said we don't have that yet and that is slowing things down because there's this adoption that has to happen just like we did credit cards you know um we now to have that with with digital ids and we'll have we already have our online banking um you know and we have our wallets but why not have a big identity with all the different stuff in your wallets and your your health and your creative right. passport and your but you know we do what we can when we can, and that's what we're doing right now. <laughs> so, I mean, Brendan, we, let's say somebody has a has that metadata in place and they've got a creative passport set up. One of the the less familiar issues will be how to get started. And we've just had a question come in from the public through the chat, which is, uh, well, verbatim, the question is, how can an artist, digital or freehand, get into this? What are the first steps? So if they came to you and your platform, what would you suggest as the... Um, the best way to get going logically uh, with your own help. Sure. So with the, um, you know, most of the major um, uh, NFT marketplaces have facilities for creators to uh, mint and create NFTs, but that's a little bit different than a turnkey service. Kind of what Amogen was saying about, you know, if, if you have uh, an overall strategy uh, that the, the people you're going to want to talk to uh, there are smart people in the community and you can reach out to different uh, uh, boards and, and communities connected to the NFTs uh, space in both on social media and the marketplaces and they can guide you through it. And so right now you probably need a specialist, but I know for a fact that there are a lot of initiatives to uh, provide turnkey services to creators and artists so that, um, and, and those will be emerging in the next few months. There's already some that are out there. Uh, I can't uh, represent any at this time, but 
they're, they're coming. And, um, you know, in six months, certainly this time next year, there's going to be some really sophisticated offerings for a whole suite of different NFT products uh, on with, with established distribution and rates and uh, uh, hopefully um, uh, some D a DAO ownership or stake. Uh, uh, Imogen was talking about the distributed autonomous organizations because that unleashes the possibility that artists at all scale, both those that are world famous like Imogen and then smaller ones can all participate in a network without being captive to the established distribution models. And that's kind of the dream. Absolutely. So, so how, about, how about you, Dan? I mean, how are you making this process easier? How, are, how is Palm going to streamline this and maybe help people who are either a bit nervous or maybe not that gifted technically um, do what they would like to do with NFTs? So we, we operate at two layers uh, of the stack. So first, you know, at the core, we're plumbers in many ways. We, we create the infrastructure that enable the tech platforms and the service providers to, to do the work they do. And so in that capacity, we wouldn't be interacting directly with artists. But we also, through the Creative Studio, partner with creatives. And Damien Hurst will be our first project. Obviously, he's an artist of, of you know, quite, quite high stature in his world, uh, class worlds, but there are other smaller artists we work with. For us, well, we select partners based on a few criteria. Obviously, financial impact is one of them, but we're most excited by artists who have a vision for how to use the technology to push forward their art. And a lot of people, I think, just want to take something they're already doing, put it in an NFT and have it sell for bajillions of dollars. And that's not really how the world works. There needs to be a reason and a thought process on what you can do with your art as an NFT that makes it more exciting and compelling as an artistic endeavor. And I think we're just at the beginning of that experimentation when that's possible. So if I were an artist looking to get into this space, I think the first thing is to answer why am I looking at this space? I think there's a number of folks who've entered it for purely financial reasons. And you can be quite successful in that regard, but in, I think just like in most other financial pursuits, you need to build your audience. It doesn't matter the platform in terms of minting your NFT as much as building the community, engaging with the community and finding your patrons. Uh, but then there's a whole set of different artists who really want to experiment with new tools, generative art, collaborative art, hard work, new financial relationships to arts, like the project like this art piece is always on sale or other efforts like that. And those, uh, I would love to chat with you, uh, and I know lots of people who would love to chat with you who are really in this with the, the creative pursuit. How, um, we have time for a couple more questions. How optimistic do the three of you feel about this technology as a truly um, revolutionary potential? Do you think there's much of a risk that ultimately uh, it, NFTs might be used to recreate or reestablish the current power imbalances in the media or entertainment space? I am slightly nervous about that, I have to say. <laughs> That's why I, um, I, it's going to be very hard to do because it's so enormous and fast spreading and there's so many independent people. Um, but I, I am a bit nervous for the music space that um, there is a history, shall we say, um, of the music industry uh, kind of taking a very hard line on things that they don't have control over um, and that have the potential to you know, stop the flow of innovation. Um, but there'll always be, I mean, for, certainly for anyone who's already signed, um, because they'll be like, oh, no, but this is a new format and therefore we need to have our massive chunk of it. Um, so that is, you know, slightly concerning. Um, but there's, there's massive hope, you know, there's such, such hope. Um, we're so early on in the time, in, in these days. And, you know, just in a little month of kind of a month or two of exploring this space, my mind has been opened up to new possibilities. I'm feeling, you know, really positive about my own creative output and that I am not limited finally to this, you know, four minute chunk. Um, but uh, that there's this whole, you know, and, and also the collaboration side of things, you know, how once we all get our identities kind of sorted out and everything's interlinking and nice and smooth, which might take five or 10 years. Um, but the idea that, you know, these NFTs might kind of go into virtual worlds and out over here and come out of the radio at this point and then go into that person's wallet and they skip over a, uh, a stepping stone in some other program and then it does 
as this and but everything's everyone's like paid fairly and acknowledged fairly like the all the worlds and all the different um mixed mixed media kind of come together um mixed, mixed yes media. it's just it's fluid and awesome so and it just felt like it wasn't really going anywhere um right now and then there's all of this ex explosion of possibility because there's no kind of box yet so yeah i'm excited that's the, oh, sorry. Yeah, Brendan, I think I can hear your voice. Please go ahead. Yes, that, that's the vision I share. Uh, I think Amit Jen got it. There, there's a lot of possibilities. Uh, you know, everything's built on top of um, protocols. And I think those, because they're available to everyone, um, of course, there's always going to be advantages that accrue to some people. But if anyone's trying to extract inordinate rents or excessive economic value from distribution, then that distribution gets to go somewhere else. And that's new. You know, in the past, it was a captured captive model. And so this technology unleashes, in my view, huge new uh, potentials. And, uh, and the long tail of creators are, I think, and I'm very optimistic about it, are going to get their due. They're going to be able to create their communities. And whether they're global superstars or not, there's going to be a space for them to get economic returns on their creativity and the audiences that they generate. And I'm really optimistic about that. Would you agree, Dan? Yeah, I completely agree. I think, I think what's powerful about blockchain for NFTs, for finance across verticals is not necessarily the elimination of middlemen, like the wholesale elimination of middlemen but rather forcing or requiring that the value that a middleman captures is commensurate to the value they create. And it's Absolutely. no longer this disproportionate value just because of their privileged position in the ecosystem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have open ecosystems of blockchain. And so I don't know a ton about music studios, that's not my world, but I'm sure they do some valuable things and some extractive things. And in, in a blockchain future, I hope they continue to do the valuable things and aren't able to do the extractive things just because they no longer have that sort of control. That's well, totally yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. I really believe that. Um, we need to kind of make this space, um, aug we need to augment the, the existing system, the existing, the, this, the existing services, and we need to be able to highlight the good work that they do and the fact that's there will become apparent um and other things will take their place and there's nothing like when they under when when certain people understand that um then then only good things can happen because if they want to survive then they need to play this fair game um so i yeah i i'm very excited about that um and when we have this kind of essential core protocol layer um where things are able to float between services and everything is kind of clean um there's just going to be a blossoming of new ways to interact with art um in such a huge way and it's going to be so much easier for the users to be able to flow through them and you know know what they can do with art so hopefully we never any more questions or emails um imogen i want to play this in my wedding is that okay i'm like yes of course it's okay like people are terrified that they're gonna be like hunted down by the police and dragged into jail for playing a piece of music uh, at a wedding um so hopefully it will just be um there'll just be a lot more ease of collaboration um and genuine kind of yeah goodwill um because nobody's worried because everybody's credited um i think that often that often stops people from working together because they're just they're worried they're not going to get credited or um anyway so yeah i'm i'm the same i'm super positive as you can tell <laughs> just um just to rain on everybody's parade of positivity, I think we've, we might be remiss in the last um, 120 seconds, not to mention energy consumption. Would one of you perhaps like to comment on NFTs and your views about some of the public concern over that issue? Yeah, so I, if you don't mind, I'll take that one. Uh, yeah, please. So first, this is not a direct answer, but I would love someone to do an analysis on the energy consumption of the traditional financing, the traditional entertainment distribution business with millions of people going into massive towers uh, every day to make those systems work. 
it's it's interesting and hard to compare apples to apples. The numbers are certainly scary when it comes to blockchain. Uh, hmm. But we already know that systems exist and are continuing to roll out that are uh, many, many orders of magnitude more efficient than the current proof of work standards. Those are coming to the Ethereum ecosystem rather rapidly with Ethereum 2.0. Palm, which will be launching imminently, is sort of a million to 10 million times more energy efficient than proof of work systems. So, uh, you know, the first car in 1914 was massively inefficient. They've become more and more efficient over time. I think the impetus and particularly the demands from creators are forcing our industry to prioritize this in a way that maybe it hadn't before and the solutions are coming to market very quickly. So it's a, it's a problem, but one, one where the technologists have heard and understood the concerns and, and will, will make the requisite changes imminently. Anybody else, 60 seconds, or do we concur completely? I concur completely, yeah. I mean, it just is, it, every single blockchain out there um, needs to be, you know, completely at zero um, in the future to be able to, to, be able to make it uh, with the public. You know, it's good that there's this massive concern. It's forcing people to get to that place quickly. Um, and those that, that can't or won't are going to fall off quickly listen thank you so much for being so wonderfully accurate with your time usage and uh with that and with a deep bow of gratitude to all of our guests i hand you back to the studio and brian thank you uh, thank you david thank you imogene uh, uh thank you dan i i, I it, it, what a terrific panel as you can see from looking across today uh, and looking at our keynotes this this entire week our community here at Hyperledger really encompasses not just the big money core infrastructure use cases like supply chains and central bank digital currencies. They also touch on issues like the fight against disinformation and reinventing the music industry. And so thank you to all of you on the panel for making that that uh, really come to light. Uh, and it's so great that we can be working on technologies like this. So um, uh, let me pivot now to the close. Thank you all. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, all.